Hey everyone, this is Vantage Points, a series about seeking connection during the COVID-19 pandemic. We take time to check in with our friends in and around the coffee supply chain and talk through all the unique challenges we are facing as an industry. This week we talked to Colleen King of Collaborative Coffee Source. Colleen is an advocate for supply chains and producers, working to educate businesses about the cost of production and how much labor is valued. In this episode, she challenges us to consider whether our current models are truly sustainable for the growth of specialty coffee. Is your model sustainable? And this is something that everyone's going to have to look at right now. You know, is it sustainable to want a coffee to be really inexpensive and you're building your business on that because your margins rely on consistently being able to find a coffee at that score, at that price? You know, that's not always something that's possible. And I think we've been living a little bit in a bubble where coffee quality was just going up and up and up and up. And prices were not increasing that much except for these really exclusive lots that were really famous. And so, you know, being this sort of warrior in between trying to advocate when there's so many other options, it can be it can be really difficult. But I also think just looking at our models to make sure that if we can sustain, that's how we make specialty coffee grow. Thank you so much for joining us, Colleen. Would you be able to just introduce yourself and um, walk through who you work with and who you work for? Yeah. Um, So my name is Colleen King, and I work for Collaborative Coffee Source. We're a sourcing company based out of Oslo, Norway, and I uh, manage relationships between roasters and uh, partners uh, in origin um, for North America. Are you doing uh, a certain region of the world for a collaborative coffee source? And like what, who, what producers might we know of, I guess? Um, yeah, so we work with um, uh, Benjamin Poss in San Vicente, um, Pepe at Origin Coffee Lab, um, Hugo at Carmo. Um, I work uh, mostly with SNAP in Ethiopia. So uh, Avanazer and Agusi are there. Um, we work with Dormans, um, Kenyakov, um, exclusive coffees in Costa Rica. Um, there's a lot of them. Colombia, we yeah. work with Fairfield Trading. So there's about seven origins that we work with right now. And you most specifically work in Ethiopia, did you say? Um, I work in all of them. All of them. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Oh, so the way it works cool. is, you know, we sort of curate um, our selections based on our market. And so it's my responsibility to figure out what we are looking for, specifically in the West Coast, um, but we collaborate on the full country. Um, and including Canada. And so I work with them and our team brings everything in. Now, this this conversation is obviously most related to COVID-19 and how this is affecting, you know, your life. You've already said you're in Pennsylvania right now in Central PA and having to travel for the good groceries. Um, but how how was this uh, most affecting or initially affecting your relationship with your producers and your roasters? Because you're right dab in the center of two parts of the industry that are really kind of could easily go bonkers quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that we got a little bit lucky in the sense that there was a little bit of a lull. We had already done like some of the buying. So when it started hitting, you know, we saw with our partners in Asia what was happening there and then expecting that it was going to affect the full agricultural sector. Um, But it was not until a few, maybe a month ago, where we started hearing that the shutdowns were happening in the global south. Mm -hmm. Other importing companies that we've spoken to, uh, they they talked about how, you know, you're because you're in the center space with, for so many people, that you're a resource. You're a resource to producers and a resource to roasteries. So, what kind of information did they come to you for, or are you still kind of grooming up those communications now that things are like we have this new norm almost? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, CCS is set up for, you know, relationship buying model. And so the idea is if you find a producer um, or a region or a coffee that you wanted to work with, then, you know, you typically buy it year to year. And so as those yields fluctuate, that's really what affects the buying patterns is can you absorb this many if it's up? Can you, you know, if it's higher price because yields are low, what does that look like for each roaster? And so that's a lot of the communication um, that we have between in that link. Um, and so when this happens, you start to see, you know, in Peru, for example, the coffees are starting to rot on the tree in the lower elevations because there's restrictions on movement of people. And I think it really highlights the 
you know, what a lot of people consider like invisible labor, the transient labor that's so necessary to do a lot of agricultural harvests. Um, and so that's a lot of the concern on the ground, a lot of these origins. And then um, in the roaster side, it's what is this going to look like price wise? And um, what about quality? And, you know, what are the commitments moving forward with such uncertainty? You know, as we navigate, like the questions that we're curious about from you, one of the things that is so obvious that at this time, because it's such a unique time, people are thriving in very unique ways. They're being super creative and adapting quickly and just showcasing the resiliency of both farmers and roasters and people like you. So what are, where are the pockets that the people around you are thriving in unique ways? Well, I would say there's a few, there's a few models depending on where you're looking at in the supply chain, but I would say, you know, in roasters, if anybody was in grocery or subscription or had a direct dialogue with their consumer base, you know, those are the people that are thriving the most. And so they can market, they can sell directly and they can ship, um, you know, people that had a significant amount of their business in the wholesale sector and didn't have that sort of communication with their brand um, are struggling a little bit more. And so seeing people pivot that had not previously engaged in that way is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I see a lot of like live streams and events going on. I think at Origin, I'm hearing a few things. One of them is I just um, talked to Nick at Veritas, and they're actually pivoting from doing data collection to trying to get the Minist National Ministry of Health to work with them and uh, some mm -hmm. of their big partners to distribute antibody tests to be able to see if some of these um, transient workers that are pickers moving from place to place to place that are very far typically from where they actually, their home base is, to be able, if everyone else needs to stay put, can they move through if they have this antibody testing and they know that they have a higher immunity? So mm -hmm. sort of pivoting models in terms of how can we serve right now has been mm -hmm. pretty cool to watch. Where is in Veritas? Sorry. I so they're based in New York, <laughs> cool. um, but you know, they're, they're this decentralized, nonprofit body, you know, that's cool. sort of all over. And um, actually in, uh, I interviewed Nick for one of my Sorceress episodes and he goes, it's, it's a long one, it's pretty in depth. And they basically were tracking how many coffee producers are in the world because they didn't know mm -hmm. that number for a long time. Where are mm -hmm. they? How many, how many are they? What are the population we're looking at? Because if we're going to help them, we need to know where they are and who they are. And, mm -hmm. um, and so they were just finishing that and they also were thinking about moving into cacao. So they had like a year or two under their belt, but now they had this data that now they can reach, you know, the people that they need to in order to help their harvest. It's pretty cool. Well, you, you highlighted the fact that you're one of the hosts of Sorceress. And one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you is because you, you've had these connections with different kinds of supply chains in a really unique way and a long relational conversation way. And I'm curious if, if you've been able to or have been reached out by the other supply chains that you're, you're either supply, uh, surprised by how they've had to respond or a unique way they've had to respond in comparison to coffee. I think that along with the question of like who's pivoting and being able to survive, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a strong um, connection and are able to market directly to your consumer base, you can do innovative things like being able to have prepayment for harvest to be able to make sure that people can actually get through and get paid because that link, you know, funding is usually the first thing that gets pulled. And so things like, you know, Sana from Diaspora Co, like she's one of those, right? And I saw you're going to talk with her. Um, but it's pretty hard to do that. Like, um, Macienda from um, LA, you know, they, they're like reviving heirloom corn in, in Mexico and finding markets here. And, you know, they do that prepayment, but now the restaurants aren't open, right? And so it depends sort of what your link looks like. Interesting to think about that with coffee. Like, I don't know how that would, how that would work, but it's interesting to think about. I think on top of like hearing about the people, I think the business side of it too, how people are doing like interesting but sustainable things and not just like charity and giving but like trying to make their business viable is also interesting and it's when we ask people to like how are you thriving it feels weird to ask that but it's like yeah like how are you making money right now like we want to know like teach us <laughs> so it's really interesting yeah I mean I also consult in the cannabis and hemp space and that's one that you know I mean hemp and cannabis are booming in some ways because they're you know at least cannabis is deemed essential in a lot of states and so but they're also having to adapt their models and figure out if you're a storefront how do you do pickup like in such a um, an industry that was so informal for a long time you know sort of setting your own pacing to be 
catapult it into this like highly regulated space and then absorb this. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting to see them innovate. And I've, I'm working with this consulting group where one of them works with, you know, she works with a lot of um, uh, agriculture compliance, um, the agricultural compliance sector. And it's interesting, you know, she brings in like, this is what they're doing in the lettuce fields right now. This is how they're rotating labor mm -hmm. right now in the Central Valley. You know, this is what these people are doing. And so it's really cool to see like, what do you do with beneficial bugs, for example, that you need for your plants? Like those are perishable too. So every part of the supply chain, people are trying to figure out how do we sustain? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty wild. It's very like we wild. Can have, we could have a whole conversation just on that this like cross-referencing like different parts of agriculture and like what are you doing what are you doing and trying to figure out how we can make it all work yeah and I mean coffee is easy. one of those things where you project so far out right and so when you're talking about it being on the water and you're really planning you know six months out at all times and so because of the nature of it having international shipping our our challenges are pretty unique because of the perishability aspect mm -hmm. That's something um, one importer we talked with, he was asking other importers, like, what do you think about anticipating like a bottleneck for like storage? Um, and if that was on anyone's mind, I don't know if CCS, if that's something you guys are worried about, you're very specialized and not too much. I mean, I could be wrong too. I mostly buy micro lots from you guys, but you, I think that's most of your business, right? It's like micro yeah. lots. Yeah. yeah, it is highly specialized. I mean, we bring in custom blends and things like that. We move full containers for people um, of one lot type thing if it's, if it's needed, but most of our business comes from the micro lots. I mean, we have a few accounts that freeze, um, which is really great. That's not available throughout the whole country, but um, mm -hmm. you know, we warehouse at the you know, major warehouses. Um, and so, as far as space, I haven't heard any concerns yet, um, but we also are a lower volume company. So it probably would be, I mean, if we were moving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of containers, I can see how that would be a problem. I honestly didn't think about that, but yeah. Same. You put them? Yeah, yeah, same. It's like when people are not buying and the stuff is still coming, yeah, where does it all go? So one of the questions that we wanted to ask each guest is, you know, it's very clear because of the kinds of people that we're interviewing that they're, they're leaders, right? And they have to show up for so many people and even so many kinds of industries like you. And I'm curious in, in the specific space you are within the supply chain, how you need the rest of these people to show up for someone like you or, or your company. Um, I think that, a lot of it is, you know, especially, you know, our model is a little bit different. It's based on relationship buying. It's based yeah. on, you know, pre-commitments a lot of times before things land. And so being able to, we really trust that the people that we work with and actually probably knows this is, you know, we expect people to be able to do their own projections. And also we can help them do that if they need to figure out anticipating a new cafe or something like that. Um, and so everyone really knowing their numbers and knowing how to, and not necessarily pivoting because things are super cheap or because they can do that. There's a big wandering eye in specialty coffee that I think a lot of people don't talk about. That is, you can always get pretty good coffee for very, very cheap. And so, you know, figuring out what your company needs and what the values are and being able to do that even when it's hard is really important. But there's a ripple effect all the way up the supply chain, right? And so in terms of producers, you know, we just keep that dialogue going of like, how can we support you? What do you need? And oftentimes we let them set the prices. So you know, having them do cost of production studies so they know how much that they need. And maybe that's more because they had loss on a tree and, and they can communicate those things just to us because either our exporters that we're working with on the ground or the produce, producers themselves have enough of that data. And then we have that stream of communication. We know so that we can talk about why pricing or why quality might change. You, you mentioned, um, it's really important for your clients to be able to make those projections. It, it kind of brought up another question that I'm curious about is what do you wish people knew about, about your position or what, what do you wish people did more of within the supply chain? Mm. Like knowing cost of production at the firm level or knowing how to project six months ahead, what would be so beneficial that you wish people would just do? All of those things. Actually. All of those things. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think what it really highlights is, you know, is your model sustainable? And this is something that everyone's going to have to look at right now. You know, is it sustainable to want a coffee to be really inexpensive and you're building your business on that because your margins rely on consisting, consistently being able to find a coffee at that score, at that price? You know, that's not always something that's possible. And I think we've been living a little bit in a bubble 
where coffee quality was just going up and up and up and up. And prices were not increasing that much except for these really exclusive lots that were really famous. And so, you know, being this sort of warrior in between trying to advocate when there's so many other options, it can be, it can be really difficult. But I also think just looking at our models to make sure that if we can sustain, that's how we make specialty coffee grow. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important to have players like I've, I've personally done work in Guatemala. I think we touched on this before where there's so many producers who don't know their cost of business. And so who don't know, like when they sell the coffee, what is even happening, but they know they're not making enough money. And I think it's so important to have players like you, even for roasters in the middle to like be a tool, but not give people the answers. Like we can help you figure out what's viable and where your business is at, but like to have them do that work and like, know, cause like you said, it's a relationship business and the only way it's going to work is if everyone knows what they need on both sides. Exactly. And I think that we've seen this, you know, especially coffee grow at this clip that was, you know, a lot of people said unsustainable for a while. And so being able to, you know, maybe this pause allows us to look a little bit and see what we really what we really want to do, but it can be, it can be really challenging because people, when you build your business already with these numbers and these constraints, there's nowhere for you to really go to make that, that choice that you could have a relationship long-term or, you know, that you're sort of investing in order to have that link. Um, it just isn't built from the beginning. And so if people are rebuilding and looking at their business models again right now, I think it's a good time to try to figure out, you know, what we maybe thought as preconceived notions of what was like top quality or, um, something that you need to have all the time on your menu, maybe that can change and you can have a little bit more sustainable for everyone. You know, we're talking about cost of production. And when, when we spoke to, um, her name is Ashley Tettleman from IDH, um, we were talking to people within the nonprofit sector that work in the coffee lands and, and how they're becoming a resource in different ways. And one of the ways that they're becoming a resource is doing a lot of data collection about uh, living income. And because I guess I come from more of um, a business background, I'm so curious about cost of production. Mm -hmm. And it was clear through conversations with her, yeah, we need both. But for some reason to me, cost of production just, you know, filters through my, my business screens. Like I, I get that. So I guess what kind of, data or information do you think would be super beneficial for like within your position to communicate we need higher prices is it cost of production is it living income or is it something else is it just saying you need to pay more i mean i'm on the cost of production train all the way honestly because i think that it's the easiest way to communicate you know if you run a business then you know that if you're selling something for lower than what it costs you to be able to present that to your customer, that's not sustainable. And so it's a really easy way to communicate all the way through and down to the customer. Um, I mean, I think all those other data points are really important, but right now that seems to be, but even sometimes when I talk to people about it, it's still difficult because that number, that cost of production is so high for them that that's not sustainable for them either. Um, so I think that if we have that number for more places, and I think that that will happen because it needs to, or we're pretty much going to see a collapse because you can't just ask a farmer to keep going into debt and not know what's going on, you know, but, um, it's been interesting to see how this is growing. And I know that there's really big companies that are talking about this, small companies, importers of all sizes that are funded all different ways that trade all different ways. They're interested in seeing this too, because we're trying to, to save this. I mean, it's, this is going to be a major point at which we're going to see, you know, what people are going to be innovative, um, creating innovative solutions to be able to see how long we can sustain specialty coffee as a whole. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like uh, cost of production is like the cornerstone that you need to know first before you can get to like living wage and all the other facts and figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is complicated too, right? Because when we're talking about wages, like I think ritual went down um, somewhere and did picking uh, on a farm and then sold that coffee as if they had the labor of the um, San Francisco's minimum wage or something or whatever the braces were getting paid. Um, and you know, that is one way to sort of show, you know, it was so expensive. I mean, I don't even know if they had sold any, but it was, you know, sort of this thing to talk about, living wage and, um, you know, sustainability and how much labor is valued. But I think the living wage side and the exchange rate is something that often gets convoluted because it's so much less to live there and that's enough money for them. Like that kind of sentiment is, I mean, it's really inappropriate for one, but it's also, I mean, it's rampant without us really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So when you say $1, $2, $3, it might feel like a lot because you don't have that other reference point. 
but I think you're right that coming later to give more context is probably a good a good thing to show people. It just really speaks to the lens that we have and I, I recently stepped into this world that is both very nonprofit but running a business as well and I come from business so it's interesting to to listen to um listen to that lens and acknowledge that so many people in and attached to our supply chain really focus on living income but because of how our brains work and how our consumers work we need that that point of reference in a different way so it's it's kind of that balance of how do we get this message out and who's listening and who needs to listen first, I guess. Yeah. And I think that in specialty coffee, like we have tried multiple ways to get people to care about the supply chain and tell stories. And sometimes, you know, I'm writing these info sheets and I just have more data and more data. I'm so yeah. excited and I'm writing all these stories. And now I've had four years of working with the same producer that I can update what they're growing and all this yeah. cool stuff. And sometimes I'm like, do people actually are they listening when we talk about this? Cause we care so much, but you know, appealing to this humanity of people that I think this, the data side is, is maybe the, the layer that we're missing because it's a little bit more clear that when you're saying you should just care about this person when it doesn't always coincide with the amount of accessibility yeah. of the pocketbook. Right. And so maybe that's the key that we haven't had before is the data. Yeah. And I was just having a conversation with someone, I think even just last night about, you know, how do we ethically tell stories and, and, um, and not take advantage of those stories and exploit those stories. And it's so important in connection and humanity. Storytelling is like basic oral history, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also this side of if, if you were to put that story in a producer's mouth, like, what are they going to say? And they're going to say, buy my coffee. Like, that's what they say. Just buy my coffee. Thanks. And that's so often when I talk to producers, like, what, what do you want to say? They're like, buy, buy my coffee. And there's, there's just like this economic fact that really, this is a business. And we have to decide if we want it to be a sustainable business or not. And there are basic ramifications of that. And that is higher prices, FOB. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And also what I hear too is come visit my farm. Yeah. Like yeah. my coffee is good. Buy my coffee and visit my farm. Like they want to connect, Yeah, you know, because it's helpful to, it's helpful to them. And I think that that's why it's so important. I know that, you know, travel is going to be disrupted and I know that travel can be expensive and the amount of, um, I mean, the, just the issue of climate change and the amount of, I mean, I was on over 60 planes last year. Um, all over the world. And like, is that sustainable? That, you know, that's a hard question that we need to grapple with, but also it's invaluable to be in person and to connect with these people and to know what's sustainable for them. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting how this, um, how this moves forward in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say it's interesting to think about, like you're saying the marketing too, of how do we get people to care? Like that, that's something we've grappled with for so long. And I write all the blurbs for the copies on our website. And every single time I have to go to do one, I'm like, okay, what, what angle am I going to take on this coffee? Because when with consumers, it's so hard. Like you list how long it dries and on, whether it's on raised beds and the patio and the hours and the fermentation, but do they understand the manpower behind that? Like, do they understand how many different hands that is? And that's only just like a month worth of work when it takes like months to even process the coffee and get to you. And then actually for some of the coffees I got from CCS, from SNAP, from Ethiopia, I took the like country background approach too of like, let's talk about like the historical economics of this country and like maybe that'll be an in. It's, there's so many different ways because you don't ever want to say too much because then you'll lose people, but it's, I don't yeah, trying to figure out what's going to hook the consumer and make yeah. them want to pay the higher price is always challenging and frustrating but also like a psychological like hmm, let's get into like the mind of how we buy yeah and this is something that specialty coffee has really had the the privilege and the burden of as being one of the first to sort of try to communicate this mm -hmm. in such a global supply chain you know they say okay coffee and wine you know they have the sensory wheel and they're so lucky and you, know, you talk to people in other industries and we're so far but we're also you know a lot of times we've hit a plateau because we're not sure how else to do this um and so 
it's interesting, um, this uh, guy that I used to work with at CCS, he was one of the original founders and he left to start his own roastery and I just got, his name is Birner, he's wonderful. And he, I just got- and He used roastery. to source in Guatemala, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I met him, okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> he's great. Yeah. Um, so he just started his own uh, roastery subscription and I got mine today, which is just so fun to still be able to get that from Norway. And on his cards, it was really interesting the way that he wrote about the coffee because he does the travel to go source. Um, it was like he was just writing about a friend and he said like a friend since this date. And, you know, and it, and it sort of implied like this is a relationship that I go and I visit and we hang out and it's past business. But he just, the way he wrote about it was so intimate that there wasn't any statistics about drying. There wasn't any mm -hmm. like necessarily tasting notes in the same kind of way that we think about them or elevation listed. It was about the way that he met this person mm -hmm. and why he thought it was important to buy this person's coffee and like the hopes that he has for their farm as you continue to buy this coffee. And I had never heard anyone write about coffee in that way. And maybe it's the nature of the subscription and it's not on the shelf or in a busy cafe, but uh, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. And I just read it for the first time this morning. So like, there's always new ways to talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I guess it goes back to the concept of what lens are we telling that story in? And the best thing we can do is speak honestly about our own lens, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that was his, like, this is my friend and they're beautiful. Yeah. And I love their farm. Yeah. Perfect. And he's also very small scale, so we can do that, right? So thinking about like, how do we tell this story from the beginning all the way to scale, depending on what size you're hoping to get and getting acquired and all of those things. Mm -hmm. I also feel like people have been using Instagram Live, my company included so much for like home brews and like talking about like our promotions and yeah, the pivots we're making. And I do feel like there's a better way we can also show the supply chain. Like you use that platform right now to show the supply chain and get our other partners involved grocery tours, farm tours, and like a, just like this, like a very kind of like small bite size, manageable chunk of information where someone might be like, oh, wow. Okay. Like this is bigger than I thought it was. So thank you yeah. for making me think of that. Yeah. I mean, I've seen tours of roasteries that I've never been to that I've always wanted to go that were maybe a little more remote than what I, what I was able to do while I was traveling. And so it's like, oh, cool. That's always what I imagined that town looked like. Or, I mean, <laughs> you know, we're making the world smaller, which is which is pretty great, but you know, hoping that that can also happen on the origin side. I mean, it's hard, internet's not always reliable. You know, people are really stressed, they're super spread out. So um, we're gonna be doing a series with exporters talking about what's happening on the ground. And so that's gonna be our live, live stream sort of series. So I'm hoping that that can, that can show as well. Mm -hmm. Where is that gonna stream it? On Instagram? That's gonna be on Instagram Live too. I think that's like the main platform that seems to be successful so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, looping back to the conversation about like, how do we go to origin in a way that is sustainable and ethical? And, you know, so many people have those conversations throughout at least, you know, this side of the supply chain of like, who should go and why are they going? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that I keep coming back to the fact that you, it might be like, a pilgrimage of some sort like this beautiful experience of like oh I finally get to see this tree and that's the case for so many like especially smaller roasters right um I just constantly see the value in it um and constantly you know all of that invisible labor these people that you would have never met there's this person this other set of hands and feet that you would have never experienced or have ever been spoken about and um I think that that kind of interaction is so important in understanding the supply chain and it really is never driven home in quite the same way and through storytelling until you see it yourself so i'm so glad that we kind of touched that for a second and it might not be that every single person has to go every farm every year like do we really need to do that now we have email and whatsapp but there are people in this industry that need to get around and it's just, I think that we'll come up with really creative ways to do that. And this is almost that first challenge of, well, I can't go. So how do I evaluate how you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that just have, and I'm sure that you've seen this too, like to see someone that has talked 
about this plant and this origin or this chain and has been able to see everything for the first time. I mean, it changes everything. It's like they can't sleep at night when you're there. You know, they're just like so excited and they're so like bright eyed and it's like they're just running on this fuel that they didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And it's because we talk about it so much, but it's so important to see. And I think even going every other year is a really sustainable model. I mean, I think part of it is also like, especially in relationship buying, knowing this person, seeing this person and being held accountable because you can actually see this person. But also I think it's important that people don't get like fancy tours necessarily yeah. for their only time that they go. I see some people that um, have been gifted tours or something like they maybe win a um, mm -hmm. competition or something and they go down and you're like, that's, I hope that they get to see other farms because that's the fanciest farm and it's so beautiful and that's so awesome. And I wish I could be there. I want to go, but also that's not a realistic picture of what's happening. And so making sure that those are wholesome and um, inclusive of, of the reality is also a really mm -hmm. important point, I think, to consider. Mm -hmm. And, and the relationships built, oh, I'm sorry, Ashley, okay. um, the relationships built make the, these times of crisis move so much more smoothly. Like that's why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you had said, oh, you know, emailed, oh, do you want to, you know, come and chat? And I was like, oh, yeah, I immediately just shot off to all of these people that I already had in my WhatsApp chain. Because it's like, oh, yeah, I visited this person in September, and this person in February. And, you know, I was already in chatting with them. But like, they got back to me immediately, because we hung out, they've come to visit me, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a different uh, situation. And that's the layer of business and personal, but also your own consistency, making sure that you say what you're going to do. You give your numbers correctly. You advocate for what they tell you to advocate for. You don't argue when they say they need more money. Like those are part of building respect throughout the chain. And they work with multiple people, you know, the same exporters work with lots and lots and lots of importers. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to have that personal connection is, it's pretty important for you to stick out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just makes a, it makes a huge difference. Like you were saying before and how your friend writes about the coffee if going there. And I wanted to point out to you, you're saying it's someone's first time going. I've been through over 50 farms and it's the same every time. So like I'm always bread eyed, full of energy. And I'm like, this is amazing seeing someone new, learning something new. But um, like you said, the relationship just makes it really easy. I spent the first two weeks just being like, all right, who do I need to contact? Who, who do we need to talk to? Like we need to figure out where they're at, where I'm at and like make sure everyone's on the same page. And it's only makes it so much more valuable when you already have that dialogue going consistently and you don't have to be like, okay, it's going to be a hard conversation or like, yeah, how do I get a hold of them? It's just completely a whole different world. And I think the, a lot of us here, like we all have that relationship management, like that's our job is right. to sort of do that. And so that's the most important thing we can do right now and like not lose sight of that as silly as it may seem to be like, my job is communicating in conversation, <laughs> but it is like, it's the only way that anyone's going to get out of this. Like, intact but. totally and i think also you know when you look at it just from a business perspective it's actually very important to be able to do that for like that forward booking and that forecasting and that and maintain that relationship because you're not just having coffee sent to you every time that you're choosing a new one writing a new write-up all these things it actually saves a lot of time if you are buying similar things and working mm -hmm. directly with these people because you know early on if you're texting with a producer if their yields are down, if they're up, what they think of quality, you know, all of these things, you are preparing your own supply chain to, you know, to be able to absorb or navigate whatever's going on. And so it's just good business to be able to do that as well. And that's a huge part of the travel too, as we were talking about, like, why is it important to travel? It's that historical context so that you know if, yeah, like you said, they're going to have a down year or if they've been having a pest problem or weather, anything like that. So, yeah, I know I'm, I'm thinking about like the, like, oh, am I going to be able to go to Columbia in September? Like, I've been going for so long. You know, I, you have these, like, traditions and your, mm -hmm. and your heartstrings get tugged. Like, I hope that everyone's okay and I don't want to have to, like, miss anything because that's part of, it's part of what makes this job so wonderful, you know? I mean, you just look forward to seeing these people mm -hmm. in person. Yeah. Well, thank you, oh, no, thank you so much for yeah. joining us um, of course. This was and so cool. answering our questions and Although this could have been just audio and that would have been very easy to consume, we just wanted to create more connection and see people's faces. And um, we keep reflecting after these calls that this is giving people the language and hopefully empowerment to talk to each other a little bit easier. Um, so thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy.
I was going to say we should plug your podcast again and also your <laughs> CCS series. Yeah. Yes. Also, is there another season of Sorceress? I'm just yeah. going to put that out there. <laughs> yes. So I'm trying to pace myself right now because I'm, I put so much on my plate all the time because I'm just, you know, I'm sure that you're all, because we're all on this call the same where you're, you're like so ambitious that it's hard. You have to like pace yourself a little bit um, mm -hmm. because we're just all so passionate. So I'm um, planning season two right now. I have my dream list of um, people and topics and it's going to be really different, more systemic or things that you wouldn't think about necessarily um, in terms of sourcing. And so I think that I'm going to wait until things settle down a little bit to be able to reach out to people. It's hard to know, like, what is your response been when you've been asking people to sit down? Have they generally had the time and wanted to talk? Have they had like, the energy? Is this, is this good timing for people? I mean, Nico, yeah. you can follow up too, but like, I think of the 20 something people we've asked, like one person was like, oh, I don't really have time. Yeah. And it's because she's in Burundi and dealing with the government there. Yeah. Like, that's it. Like she yeah. wanted to join us, but just like, it was too much. Yeah. Um, so it feels like everybody is really excited to talk to each other and is, you know, hungry for that and hungry for information. And all of our brains are just in a, an interesting space where they're so open because we're just like all just sitting and thinking. And um, so it's a perfect time for reflection. And I think to report upon that reflection. So it might be a great time to start reaching out. Yeah. I feel like from a lot of people, what we've heard too is like, even though you're busy trying to yeah manage all the thoughts in your head and pivot your business, it's also like most people, the best platform for them right now is online and social media and podcasts and stuff like that. So it's really worth it to like take advantage of this. And then like Nico is saying, everyone's in a reflective pattern. So I feel like we've had so many conversations where we're all coming to realizations and like brainstorming together and like yeah. we'll hang up and be like, Oh, I didn't even know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So I think it's, there's something, there's a lot of pros to this time. And I think if you have a dream list of people who you're not scared to reach out to right now, it could be worth it at least to start some of them now. Yeah. Maybe touch base. Um, I have one thing that I think if we can talk about really quick, just so that I think is important to cover, is that in terms of pricing, I don't really know what's going to happen moving forward. Mm -hmm. But I think that one conversation that's really important for people to have right now is like, where is the baseline for what people are paying for like an 85, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. that's something that's going to be really interesting because when I was talking to some of um, our partners at Origin, it seems like it's possible coffee quality is going to land in this really shallow range, mm -hmm. like 84 to maybe 86 for the next year. Yeah. And I think that looking forward, what that looks like to consumers and how we, if we keep our prices the same, but we're serving that, you know, what is that going to look like in terms of where those profits and that, that margin falls, I think is something really important to like sort of ideate on because I think it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's been like a big message for buyers. Like we've had that conversation with a few people now where it seems like those like super high quality, like maybe high 80s might get blended in. So you're going to have like that more middle range. And I mean, for me personally, I got out ahead, like even with CCS and I, I already like committed to some of those lots that are not that are offered right now, those micro lots. Mm -hmm. But I think it is really interesting for people to think about. And I think it's a huge point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, this was so fun. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so fun. Thank you so much, Colleen. It was so great to meet you.